Okay, thank you for tuning in to Stampscaping 101. This is a scene right here that I finish off from a stamp sketch version of it done in a previous video. And I've just, I don't know, I've had this kind of notion of how I wanted to finish this one off. And I uh, just finally got around to doing it. Uh, I've been working on some other things and in inventory and whatnot, but I was really itching to get around to doing some stamping and I sat down with the intention of doing some of my other designs, but uh, when I stamped this one out in my previous video, I really, you know, felt like finishing it off, so I decided to do that one here. I've added in some additional um, imagery uh, that became available to me in the last couple weeks in the form of this hanging little branch right here, but a lot of dye-based inks in here pigment inks that you've seen me used in the past, but I played around with a little bit of colored pencils in here, which I've done in the past on a video too, and uh, some other types of touches here and there with some paint pens and some gel pens to kind of round out this uh, overall, I don't know, vision of kind of a warmer kind of springtime day in dedication to all of you out there that are kind of in you know, freezing temps and, uh, I don't know, what would they call that, a winter vortexes and whatnot. And I've added little, little you know, what says spring better than uh, little wild, wild flowers and whatnot. And uh, so those have been added into the composition here to hopefully add up to a nice, rich, and varied surface with a lot of depth and texture and... Uh, warmth and uh, all those other types of uh, notions, you know, that we can associate with a springtime scene. So anyways, if you choose to watch it, I hope you enjoy the video. And I really enjoyed finishing this one off and seeing where this uh, composition would take me in terms of the uh, kind of the finishing process. So if you have any questions, drop us a note in the comment section. Okay, let's see what we can do with this composition here. We started it in the, um, oh, one of the previous videos as far as um, some stamp sketches with the latest, uh, one of the latest stamp sets. And uh, I provided a nice foundation with that set. And then I've filled in with some additional trees like tree cluster and tree cluster large. And um, I don't know, I have a hard time kind of leaving, you know, kind of an, uh, a scene unfinished, you know, I mean, I can, but I, I don't know, it kind of, uh, if it's sitting on my desk, I, I just really feel like finishing it off, and uh, I don't know, it kind of all starts, of course, when you do the composition, and uh, kind of ideas going through your head as far as the ways to finish it. Now, I could make this into kind of a winter scene, but um, I don't know, a lot of people are having some pretty cold weather around the country and around, I don't know, around the, I don't, it might maybe around the world too, but for you, for you that are living through these, you know, extreme cold spells and unseasonably cold weather, it's not cold weather, I'm taking it anyway, but uh, kind of extra cold, this is for you. I'm going to do kind of a warmer, um, kind of a spring scene out of this one. But I don't know, it would be interesting to do this in winter, you know, can you imagine this kind of frozen like thing? But let's keep it more on the uh, the warmer side, okay? All right, so um, what I have right here, I just have some rain cure fluid, okay? And you can use any light blue dye-based ink uh, Ringer fluid. I have a lot of area right here. This is a half page scene uh, which is eight and a half by five and a half inches and what I'm going to do, that's a lot of area to color in, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, going to provide a nice base layer and this base layer right here, it's not too light of a color. I kind of went with a color that I thought you know you might be able to easily um, you know have access to in, in terms of a a purchase. Um, you can go with all kinds of things. Here's kind of a weathered wood. I don't know, it's kind of more of a gray tone. I'm going with a blue because blues will be in my water and in my grass area here. But you can go with like a gray tone as well, okay? And what this is going to do is it's going to kind of start filling in 
but what I'll do with this is I will start to define kind of my lighting scheme with this color as well, okay? Now I'm using a very light touch here. A lot of people, you know, when they first kind of play around with them, an ink applicator, they feel like they have to kind of have, you know, a real firm contact with the paper and uh, to lay out colors that way, which you can, of course, but it makes it a little bit more precarious. So I'm using a very light touch right here. I'm barely touching my paper. And I have that anchor, you know, anchor in here, so it's pretty saturated. So I don't want to get a big slathering of a uh, color. Okay, just lightly lean it down, and then if I want it darker and more saturated, I just go with additional applications. Okay, now see in here on my water, I want to have you know some variation. I don't see this as one body of you know, space that needs to be filled up equally in terms of my approach with the color, okay? So, you want to kind of vary it a little bit more, I think, for some visual interest. And you would see that kind of out in nature, too. So don't see whole areas just to be filled in equally. That's where you kind of lose your lighting. It doesn't make it more complicated, but it just means to use less ink than you might feel inclined to. So don't just fill in everything, okay? Have it a little bit more streaky, and there is no kind of set amount that you're supposed to lay in. Now, for some people that might kind of add stress to it because they want to know exactly how much of something to lay in somewhere and uh, you know, have it more of like a formula rather than something like, you know, something varied, okay? But just kind of start laying some in, all right? And then don't keep working on it. That's, I don't know, that's my best advice as far as that goes. And to actually look at it and take a look at what's kind of happening in your scene periodically, okay? Adding a little bit more tone around that little pier there. These streaks in my water like that. See that? It's a little bit more varied instead of just all filled in. When you fill it all in equally, it makes the scene seem a little bit flat, okay? Now I'm kind of working around my cabin here. I'm trying not to get... Um, I might get a little bit of blue into my cabin, which is not going to be any big deal. But uh, for the most part, I want to leave that... Uh, a little bit untouched, you know. I might get a little tinge of uh, blue into it just to create a little bit of continuity between um, the colors that I'll add into the cabin and the surrounding area, okay? Now, blue, the reason why I'm putting this blue up into an area where there will be grass is because blue is a component of green, right? So I can add that hue into those areas, and then when I go over it with green, it'll just read as green. Can you still see, you know, little areas on my uh, shoreline? I'm leaving um, light, so it looks like the light is hitting it, okay? Here and there. It just means to oscillate things a little bit more. Have, you know, some things varied, okay? You want to get into a little, tight little detail there as you can with something like this. I can use alcohol pens in my shadows as well. Something like that. I, I think this is all going off of one inking, too, of my uh, applicator right here, too. So you can get a lot of coverage, you know, this way. And that's, I did a video on the benefits of re-inkers, you know, just kind of loading up your sponge. Especially with, I don't really do that with, you know, um, the darker tones. It's just the first color where there's, um, you might be utilizing a lot of it. And that really makes things a lot easier as far as the application process, especially on larger compositions. Looks very textured in here. All right, and you want to really kind of establish your kind of lights and darks in some of my shadow areas around and on the imagery. 
and I'm just using my imagery as, you know, taking my cues from the imagery, there are some darker areas on the images, right? Where like maybe this cabin is casting a shadow. I can see it in the black dots, the stippled dots that I have drawn into the design. And I'm just reiterating that with a little bit of tone like this, okay? At the base of some trees, there's a shadow on the base of the trees. It kind of anchors my trees down, but that tone alone gives it kind of a starting point, but adding a little bit more with your applicator. See, it's darker right in here at the base of the trees. So I'll just go in there and add a little bit more. Remember to keep a nice and light touch, okay? Blend it around. Don't worry about things looking um, perfectly smooth at this point in time. We have a lot of other colors to go that we'll be blending over the top of that, okay? I can tap and drag. What happens is when people say that this technique of uh, kind of glazing colors isn't, isn't easy and it's because they go like this. This is like a piece of just blank paper. They go like this and then they get these big thick marks like that. But this is your touch right here, okay? It's just building up nice and slowly and I want to go darker, okay? But what happens is they go like this. I can't see anything. And then they go like that, right? And then you leave these thicker marks like that. So just kind of give it time, and you'll find that this is not a long process to do. It's just kind of, if someone tries to rush it and they get unintentional marks, and they try to kind of eradicate those things with some additional things. And sometimes if it has a harsh mark like that, they keep going over it and over and over it to try and smooth it out. But what they do is they kind of end up making that mark darker and darker and darker. And you see this contrast between the white and that page right there. And it's it, you can blend that out with some additional tones or the same color, but you just have to kind of keep working it like this. And, you know, it just keeps it uh, a nice gradual and uh, kind of easy method, okay? It's just not a hurried one in terms of, you know, something like a, uh, you know, calligraphic mark, or let's say if we're coloring something in, that sky is sky blue, we grab a sky blue pen, and we just fill it all in, you know what I mean, like a coloring book or something like that. This is a little bit, it's not too unlike that though, but you just do less coloring, okay? in terms of the retention of your lighter areas. So on here, I mean, this could have been lighter over here. I just, I don't know, it just happened to end up right there, so. A lot of variation. Okay, so let's start going in with, oh, I don't know, let's, let's, let's stick with our water right now. I have this blue, you know, tip right here. Let's just go with a little bit of a darker blue. This is Memento Bahama Blue, and this is going to be a, you know, medium tone blue. And let's start working our water a little bit more. I don't need to clean off my tip. I'm just going straight into the darker, uh, slightly different hue. Well, it's, it's the same hue. It's a different, I guess it's a different intensity. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a different temperature. Although the Bahama Blues does seem to have maybe the slightest warmth to it. I'm not really quite sure, but do you see the difference between here and here? And I just added a little bit of tone in there, but you can see what a difference it makes. See that? It looks a little bit colder over here, doesn't it? And that looks a little bit warmer. It's definitely richer, though, over here, because I have that other layer of blue in there. What, mind your lighter areas in here now that you're going with your, you know, your next tone. Retain your kind of lighting scheme. It doesn't mean that you can't go in there a little bit, but I would just in general kind of maintain some of that variation that you've established with your first color. Okay. So look at that. Doesn't that look nice and rich and, uh, I don't know, not, I wouldn't call it tropical, but just, you know, your warmer, kind of inviting 
rich um, I don't know, it's kind of a rich surface, I guess we could say. You can bring some of this into your meadows and everything like that too, your your shoreline. Okay. Alright. Now I'm I'm gonna be bringing some of this and I have some of the more deciduous trees in here as well. I'm gonna say that this is more of a springtime type of thing than a fall, so I'm going to keep these trees more in the green uh, spectrum, okay? Uh, which will relate to the shoreline as well. Now the scene is going to get a little bit darker, so we'll call this kind of like, you know, maybe it's getting later on in the day, and uh, maybe it's uh, kind of more around uh, kind of the dusk period. Okay, so keep that dusk period sometimes. It's we have some nice saturated tones, or maybe it's more around twilight when we don't have that golden light shining off things. Although that would be nice too. Now, <laughs> see, I, I mean, I could still go the winter direction on this, which would be really fun. I, I see this taking on some darker tones, blue tones, and then I can have like you know that chimney up there uh, with some kind of a smoke coming out of it, which would be fun. I'll do that on another scene. But let's uh, let's bring in some uh, some warm tones for you out there that are kind of cold and running your heaters a lot and uh, I don't know, fireplaces, whatever, bundling up. And we're totally wimps out here in terms of uh, Southern California in terms of cold, you know, but because um, uh, we're not acclimated, so. I'm a little bit warm myself with this uh, base layer on. So this is kind of for me too. But I fully recognize <laughs> we're not in, you know, negative, you know, uh, temps over here. Like some of you. Alright, so I'm kind of giving a little bit more depth around here, see that, kind of that edge. I'm trying not to bring this blue, oh by the way, this is a, a Danube blue. It's kind of a navy blue, you can use any kind of navy blue. I'm kind of hitting this around right on the shoreline right here. Okay, and I'm kind of dragging it in a little bit. I'm using the side of my applicator to get in some, you know, kind of a tighter area. You know, what I'll do is I'll dab it, and then I'll kind of drag it like that to kind of, you know, smooth it out a little bit. Okay. So it kind of creates this little differentiation between um, shore and water when you put that little extra touch in there with some uh, ink, darker inks, okay? And again, I've drawn that into the design, so you can kind of give that, uh, that's kind of your head start there. shadow areas a little bit more around my cabin like that. Okay, all right. Let's start to address our grassy areas, okay? All right, now I'm not going to use that tip anymore. I'll use, uh, this tip's getting a little hard. I feel it getting a little 
crusty around the edge. Might be time for a new one. Style this till it's just kind of popping out like that. And put in a new one. This one right here, I'm guessing, is. I know it's over 15 years old or something like that, so. Oh, yeah. See, kind of when I went like this, it's kind of. There's little particles like that, so. That's when you know. You know, it's pretty much time to switch out. But I'll take that, you know. We want these tips to last a long time, and if you use them like I do with that light touch, they'll last you a really long time. And, I don't know, I've never had any problems with... I'm trying to think if I've ever had any kind of defective one. There are ones that have lasted longer than others, sure, but um, for the most part, you know, they... I don't know, they work really well. Alright, so this is a peeled paint distress ink, okay? It's kind of a, it's kind of a, you know, that aged green, weathered looking green of the, typical of the, uh, you know, the distress line of inks. Okay. Thank you, Tim Holtz, for that. Giving us something other than your typical uh, line of hues, or variations on different hues. Okay, adding this into my grassy area, warming those areas up. Now I'm going to use, you know, much more green in here, so this is just my first layer to kind of establish it. I think the peeled paint was kind of my my lightest of uh, my greens that I happen to have, so that's why I'm going with that one first. I'm just going to be working it through a range of values within a given hue. So if you have a light one, then use the lightest one first, OK? OK, I'm just kind of establishing that. Now I'll go into my shadow areas and add that down. I can go into my trees as well. You don't have to go over everything. You can, you can retain some of that white if you want. Okay. My distress green is a little bit dry, so I'm I dabbed into my uh, little puddle of uh, reinker fluid to that will help me lubricate this tip here a little bit more. You really want to get a pretty good saturation of inks. That really helps the uh, the application process. Okay, don't be afraid to dab and lightly streak. Okay, all right. Now that's an ugly, ugly look right now. <laughs> so um, that happens when you're doing these scenes. Sometimes you go through that period of an application, but that color is just kind of a foundation for these other colors to come, okay? Now this is a yellow-green, okay? Similar colors could be, well, let's see, I, I didn't see it here, pear tart would be good, and memento, we have bamboo, I'll, I'll use these ones too, and this is just a, a marvy color right here, uh, which probably people don't have, so here, let me switch up in here, but just to show you, you know, just, I don't know, pull out all the, the greens that you have in terms of dye-based inks if you're going through this coloring process right here, and line them all up from light to dark, okay? It really should be like this in terms of the progression of uh, values to be added, okay? Something like that. Now, a lot of you have, like, tons of colors, and I don't know, I wouldn't say I have a ton of them, but if you're putting together kind of a, a pad collection, a lot of times it's, you know, we get our basics, and um, but as far as kind of adding in some additional tones, if you want to do it a little bit more strategically, what I would recommend is thinking about the different hues, okay? So you have your brown tones, your blues, your warm tones like yellow, orange, red. If you have the distress inks, you have some variations of tanned brown, you know, um, as well as other colors, but um, 
I would, you know, if you were, you were to evaluate your um, range of uh, pads that you have, look to see if you have kind of a, a light, medium, and dark of all of them. You know, just the basics, and uh, you should really, really good to go as far as um, your color choices. If you choose to layers layer colors like you know, in this manner here. And uh, having that variation like that, you can then start to think about blending colors, you know, you can do a blue and a yellow and that will make a green, a light blue, a light yellow can form a light green if you didn't have a light green in your, you know, your supplies. So that's one good thing about um, dye base stinks and uh, you know this particular coloring process I don't do everything this way but um, if you are it makes it a lot easier okay. just a few select colors can really go a long way as far as the coloring process because of that blending and transparent aspect to them okay see how this is really starting to warm up here it's still looking, you know, pretty minimal, and uh, it's not really, there's not a lot of variation right now, so it's looking a little anemic. So let's go in and try some of these other tones right here. I know they'll blend because they're all within the same color family, so let's try this pear tart. If something, if I start adding in some colors and I can't see any type of change at all, then just move up into your darker tone, okay? And now I'm using this over some other colors too, okay? So I can't see the true, you know, um, hue because it's over the top of, you know, the distress ink, the other blues that have already been laid down, etc. But I can kind of see some difference in terms of uh, how it's looking over the top of all them. I can tell this pear tart is kind of, you know, bringing up my intensity a little bit. And what I'm doing right here in terms of the layering process, when you layer colors like this um, that are analogous colors, colors that are right next to each other on, say, the color wheel, what this does is it creates a color glow. And the colors just seem to kind of vibrate and uh, they just pop off the page a little bit more. See how everything's... I, I feel that with this color right now, in terms of the greens, this is the color now that is starting to kind of bring everything together. But it's not as if, you know, the colors underneath that aren't showing so predominant, you know, apparently are lost. Those are adding to this overall richness that we are now achieving through this kind of this layered process. And it's just filling in more, okay? Let's move on up. Let's go to our bamboo leaves. We're moving into our mid kind of value colors. It's kind of light to mid, I would say. I usually start adding into my darker areas first, and I progressively work into my lighter areas. You can't really see too big much of a difference, you know, when I lay that on right there. Can you see that very much? Not really. But if you just kind of add it on, Things just start to glow a little bit more and look a little bit richer as a result. Okay, I see this little deciduous tree up in here, down here as well. Okay, so that cabin. Now that cabin really needs to be addressed. It's uh, anytime you're adding in this you know, kind of amount of layering. It's really important, even if something represents something that's supposed to be white, which this is not, you know, be sure and color it in, otherwise it looks kind of, uh, kind of unfinished, right? Here's a Memento Cottage Ivy. It's kind of more of a, like a pine green tone. Kind of a darker pine green. Add that up here, I can kind of see it. My 
shadows right around in here. It looks quite different though than it did a couple minutes ago with just that distress green, doesn't it? It's hitting my shadows right here. I had that blue shadow, now it's kind of more of a greenish tinge. Maybe a blue-green a little bit. Okay. See, isn't that nice, that variation in here? See, it's not all that green everywhere. So you just kind of establish that with your first colors that you start to lay down. You know, you have some areas that you've retained as white. And you just maintain that you know, that lighting scheme throughout your coloring process. All right, here's some trees right here. Let's add a little bit of a shadow at the base of them. Okay. Something up here. All right, this is where things start to look a little bit too kind of greenish, you know. Which, of course, you know, I am using on here, but I'll show you what I do about that. It's Sometimes it's too green, and there's a simple process. When I start getting in my cab and I start adding in kind of tans and browns, it's, I think it looks great to bring those colors into my grass as well. So this is basically going to be a blue, brown, and green color scheme. Real earthy tones, right? So we have the blue down here in the water and the blue comes up here in the grass, right? And I'll add the browns in the cabin and pier, but the browns will come down in this grass. So this grass is kind of like the, I don't know, kind of the, the middle um, element within the scene that brings these two areas together because the grass relates to the blue as well as the grass relates to the uh, cabin in terms of having a similar color in there. All right, so there that is. Okay, cottage ivy. All right, now if you'll allow me, I will go in with some of the actual pine green Marvy. Marvy is a little bit thinner. Wow, this ink is really, this pad's just about had it. I don't know if you can see that kind of dent on there. This is a very old pad. This is probably 20 years old. It's not crumbling, but I can still get some color off it. But the uh, the pad is really discerning to uh, to break down the sponge part of it. But I'm just adding in a little bit more tone around these um, shadow areas that I can get with this. I'll use some alcohol markers on here too, and of course the alcohol markers, you know, are very kind of detail oriented in terms of uh, being able to get really specific areas, but if I can get it using kind of this wider, you know, tip like this, I'm going to do that just for um, kind of speed, expediency, you know, sake. Just to expedite the process a little bit. All right, so anyways, it, but I'd say the spirit of this changed a lot, you know, just from having those blue tones up and now we have this warm element, so we've kind of uh, expanded our temperature range of the scene by having something warm against something cool, okay? But, you know, like I said, you can do this exact same composition over again and you can have it all blue and it would really change the spirit of it in terms of the, uh, uh, the temperature scheme of the scene. All right, now I happen to have a bottle green here too. If you don't have that, you can always use like a black in here, which I might do as well. Bottle green is the darkest of the Marvy green uh, green hue. Sometimes I I grab that thinking it's black, but it was really green. If I'm kind of in a hurry and I don't really pay attention. See how dark that is? Look at that shadow down here. Let's see. See how I turn my page so I can get to this area really easy? And I can see what I'm doing. If I'm doing it like this and I, I'm going like this, I can't see it right there. So I turn it like this and I can see exactly where I'm placing that like that. Okay.
Yeah, right at the base of the cabin as well. Let's, when you add that shadow down here at the base of the cabin, it really anchors that cabin down, doesn't it? And like I said, I have drawn those shadows down there for that reason, to give people a, an idea of where they can add additional anchor point, you know, kind of hue or values. It could be in colored pencil, chalks, whatever. Kind of just reiterate what you see on the scenes, okay? All right, let's, same thing in these little um, shorelines right here. I have this texture that's been defined with a little bit of stipple work. And I'm going in here and just reiterating it a little bit, giving it a little bit more dimension. Okay, so what I mean by that is, you can see this little shoreline, these little areas right in here, you see that right there? So I'm not going, I'm just barely adding it on, and I'm doing it with a very light touch, so that it just adds a little bit of tone like that at a time. When you do that, you have perfect control over it. I would say the majority of my marks, maybe 60, 70, well, maybe 70%, it's just a very light touch, and I do things with repetition, okay? Like this. Now sometimes for like vast swatches, I might be, you know, applying a little bit more of a, you know, my marks have more contact with the, uh, the paper, but for the most part it's kind of a lighter touch. And I just build it up, you know, to the point of, uh, to the darkness that I want. Okay, that looks pretty good there. Let's go with um, another um, hue, all right? Let's look at this cabin right here, and uh, let's take a look at some of these distressing tones. Here's a memento as well. Here's a rich cocoa, desert sand. These are kind of nice colors, and they're not very warm, though, are they? So you add something like this distress ink in here. It looks like it has a little bit more yellow in here, doesn't it? Tea dye. Let's see if those will add kind of a nice warm um, tinge to that wood right there. You really want wood to look kind of, you know, to express, um, you know, a warm warmth. Especially since it's a cabin too, you know, you want to, uh, you you want those things to look nice and fighting. Okay, this cabin right here, I'm going to uh, add this color in like this, but I'll also bring some of it into my roof top a little bit. See, it's just barely adding any color on there. Okay, and I tapped around on there a lot. So that's just kind of gives you the idea of how fast I, I work, which is not, you know, too fast. It's not, you know, it's not slow, but it's it's kind of methodical. I'm not just going in with this dark brown cocoa and just coloring it right in, okay? I build it up, and that way it's really hard to make any kind of mistakes because you're just building things up so slowly. So here's this tea dye, okay? And let's bring it into our, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit more here. And I'll add it in a good portion. I'll just add it right over the top of a lot of this to see if that I can give that grassy area, green area right now, very vibrant green, kind of a more of a toned down, kind of mellow look to it, okay? So I put a little bit over my uh, pier there, dock, whatever. I'm coming in with this into my lighter areas because this color right here is so very light anyway. Now this right here, see this color right here bothers me, just that straight green, so I will bring some of this into there. I'll bring in some of my darker browns too. And hopefully it kind of takes on a more earthy look, and that's what I always do with my grasses. Grasses usually have kind of this brown tinge in them, okay? But see, that's just one brown. I have several right now, so it'll work there. But you see that little tinge there? And over here, 
it just looks a little bit more mellow and you have that tone in these two areas so what you do is you create this kind of kind of visual continuity from one object one natural object to the next and that creates this kind of overall harmony within a scene okay yeah it looks that that and it, it has a more pleasant look to me um, just with that little touch okay and this is so light of a color this is why I have people start off light when they change colors too I mean if I wanted to I can just go like okay and you're not doing any kind of damage to it that's why it's just kind of better to start light and you know like I said this is not a hard process if you kind of take it in that nice methodical manner desert sand I don't think that you will be able to see this very much at all in terms of its pure form of that you know because I didn't retain very much um, white of the paper but we'll just kind of blend it in and hopefully it will add to the richness if you can't see it at all you know through multiple taps just move on to your next color you know move on incrementally through your darker tones let's see what this looks like let's bring some of it into my water Again, desert sand. It's kind of a, a really strange notion, isn't it, to bring like a tan into blue? But it's so light, um, it can take it like that. And I'll bring some of that into that white area, those little streaks down there, okay? I can barely see it, but I can tell the difference. I don't know if it picks up on the paper uh, camera, sorry, at all, but you can see that little tinge of warmth in here. Okay. And sometimes I wonder what these colors are good for, other than doing something like this, because if you try to stamp something out in this, <laughs> it would be so light, but I, I love that they have that, you know, that type of thing, because it's perfect for me. Okay, here's an antique linen. Did I use that one? I used the tea dye, right? Let's go for the walnut stain right here. The walnut stain starts moving up into a little bit of a darker um, version of, you know, those brownish kind of earthy, woody tones, aged tones. I guess it's maybe not necessarily woody, but um, adding it some down on the cabin. The well, cabin is a little bit darker in certain areas, the vertical sides of it. So I'm just going in here. And I'm bringing some of that down to my grass as well, okay? So add it in the cabin, add it in the grass, add it in the shadows. Give that area around the cabin something that will kind of relate to that cabin itself, which is hue. Okay, and temperature and richness. When you work this way with color, you don't have to stay within the lines, actually. Staying within the lines um, is not a uh, necessity at all. You could, though, but you just don't have to. Okay, going into this pier, I'm not necessarily seeing this pier as one uniform application of the same value of a, a given color, so I can kind of leave some of it as is, is. I'll streak it on a little bit. This walnut's really beautiful in terms of uh, that little richness right there. See that right there? bit. Okay, you see that? So it's a nice kind of welcome, welcoming glow, warm glow to that cabin. Because if you're doing a haunted cabin, we don't want it too welcoming, but you know, you can do that too. <laughs> so you just change the spirit of, um, you know, your, your scene with the with the colors that you choose. You know, there's colors of a, you know, that kind of emotional 
kind of a impact. Like that shoreline it looks much better than that first color that when that first color was laid down too huh or the peeled paint the peeled paint was not an ugly color it just looked kind of strange on there as is but look at how this is really glowing now and see how i've retained these little areas of light okay i mean this area here could have been light this could have been dark you know it just that's just the way it ended up i wasn't you know I wasn't even thinking about it at all, you know, I didn't plan it, I just kind of laid down some streaks of color and just, you know, you just go for it, you just go, you know, you just kind of develop it and uh, things don't have to be so kind of thought out, all right? Now again, I, I, I do realize that for, you know, a lot of people, they want more of a strategic thing, they want to know where things are going, okay? And you can, you know, just I don't know, I, I would say just be a little more free form and just don't do so much and then you can kind of get, you know, pretty methodical with these other colors that you lay on top of it. In terms of, you just add a little bit more color where you've added that base layer color and just avoid your lighter areas now, okay? Um, but, do, and, you know, just do try to free up a little bit and just do, sometimes, it, you know, a lot of times it's just doing less, you know, because like I said, sometimes this whole area is filled in with uniform dark tone greens, which means they've used all the colors to their full extent everywhere, as opposed to when you get darker, you just use less, it's in kind of the shadowy areas. And you can just look at the designs, anywhere you see, um, kind of black little dots, that's where you just kind of fill in a little bit and you just do a little bit of a lighter swatch and that's kind of the process right there. It can be done in, uh, you know, colored pencils or chalks or something like that too, building things up as opposed to seeing vast areas to be filled in equally. And in the end, what you really are doing is you're just, you're doing less, really than, you know, some sort of complicated process and adding more. Okay, now I gotta be careful around here because there's that white right there, so I'm, I don't wanna get this sponge, you know, tip, you know, look right in there. And some around my trees. It's a little bit too greenish, you know, greeny up there, so I'll add a little bit of tone. Okay, that is enough of the rich cocoa. The rich cocoa served us well, didn't it? Okay, so let's take a look at some different pens. I have some different pens. A lot of you have some really nice pens in terms of like a full set of, uh, you know, your name brand alcohol markers. I happen to have a full set of some very not name brand markers you know, in terms of shuttle art, but they serve me just fine. Okay, so let's take a look and how I'll approach this. Okay, let's take a look at some green tones right here. Here's a terracotta. This one looks nice. Yellow, yellow ochre. I'm grabbing some colors that kind of are related to the colors that I've just laid down, right? So you're just going, going to go in and reiterate, you know, some of these tones. I see a lime green there for some reason. So here's my La Plume, permanent La Plume. See these, all these colors didn't, you know, these ones look like the ones I have uh, already applied. Here's a burnt sienna and a brick brown. I usually don't go with the darker tones because I don't want to leave a, like a real definitive streak anywhere. I've actually tried this before too, but um, I don't know. One time, I just out of curiosity, normally I don't do this, but um, like here's a colored pencil, you know, if you want to see if you can kind of add in a little bit of tone. I mean, this 
actually does stick to um, my uh, glossy cardstock too. You know, just you know, getting a few. I'm not going to color in a vast area, although I don't know. It looks like I can, but uh, you know, I'm just kind of reiterating some of these slats on here, or you know, on this walkway, I can kind of come across like this. Use whatever you have. You don't have to stick to, you know, okay, I'm doing a Copic marker scene, or I'm doing an, uh, a pastel scene, or I'm doing dye-based inks, okay? I mean, you have all these, all this different media out there. Different media, I mean, it's, there's, have their own strengths, you know? I can do a little, you know, specific line like this. So what I'm doing on this pier right here in some of those slats, I'm just doing this type of thing, right? And a lot of you, you know, we, you know, we have different media out there. We don't have to be limited to a certain technique on a given scene. Just use, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean you want to, uh, you know, I don't want to use, you know, a ton of different media for every scene that I do, but you could um, in many ways, and you don't have to just abide by, you know, kind of the, the standards of what's been kind of established in terms of a technique or something like that. You know, you might just incorporate it all if you want to. All right, let's take a look and see what value this is. It's, it's a fairly light blue, right? So what I can do is I can just kind of come in here and I I'm just kind of going around on my shoreline, you know, and remember what I said about kind of kind of darkening the shore a little bit more. I can do that with this. It's just kind of filling in a little bit more, and this color is a transparent color, so the colors underneath are, you know, I'm still benefiting from that. This alcohol ink is not just covering it up completely. It's just kind of laying on the top of it and giving me a layer an additional layer. I don't want to have to do too much blending out, so I'm not going to come out too far with it. You could, though, but I just don't want to. All right, same thing around in this little area around on my cabin or on my trees. I can add a little bit of a shadow down here, and you're saying, well, you're adding blue. Well, remember again, blue kind of relates to green, so I can just add that down there. And it doesn't look like blue. It just looks like some other form of green or something like that, or I've added some brown in there too. So it, it's just kind of another layer of a uh, hue, um, another layer of value, a shadow, whatever. I can even add some of it into my cabin a little bit. And not and have it not look good. <laughs> That's a little bit too bluish green. So here, let's come into what is this one? Yellow ochre. Let's go into that cabin, and like a blending tool, just kind of blend that blue in a little bit. Okay, come into my wood stack and add some of this on my rooftop here and some more detailed areas. Okay, so. All right, warming up my pier a little bit with this, getting those pylons a little bit, coming down to my grass. There's actually a little fence down there. If I want to get really detailed, I can color those in. And you're doing that with this one. You know, this is much more conducive to something like that than this, of course. Let's see how, you know, things are looking a little bit more, I don't know, Kind of uh, developed, I guess. A little bit more of a kind of a, a color scheme that's kind of I don't know developed or here's a lighter green. I can hit these trees, you know, some of this deciduous tree in its leafy form now coming up in here I usually don't like to go too much darker than how it already is you know or too much brighter so I'm just kind of tweaking it 
little bit more. It's this little area down here, it's a little bit, that little grassy area is a little anemic, right? So I can kind of warm it up like this using a very light green. And if you have your blender tool, you can kind of lay down some of your alkalinks and blend it in a little bit. And that's really fun. Right around in here. So this is really warming up some of my kind of more cooler um, greens, you know, that where I might want it to look a little bit warmer or developed. Maybe I, you know, I didn't develop it too much because I just might have missed it with my other color, or I didn't want to get too close to, say, some kind of object. And that's where you can just hit it with something like this. And to really get into some areas that, um, that you might have missed or whatever. And uh, that's also really fun to watch areas kind of come around a little bit more. See how dimensional that looks now? Okay, this is a terracotta. Let's try this one. A little bit more of an orangish tinge. I can hit certain areas of this cabin. Maybe I'll leave some areas just as is. I'm just putting little, I'm doing little marks like that. Okay. I think that's enough of that. Let's see this one right here. Brick brown. Let's take a look. How about underneath my eaves? It's a little bit almost too dark. So what I can do is I can lay some of this down. Ew, that one's almost too dark. Go back into our lighter tones like this and use that as a blending tool and just kind of spread that out a little bit. You can actually use a blender, but I, for me, the, the blenders can also just be lighter versions of that given um, value. Okay, so, looking pretty good. I, I'd say our color schemes and everything like that look pretty well established. I don't think it really needs anything more. Let's try something, though. All right, let's try... Let's see if I have an even lighter blue somewhere. Here's a really super light blue. This one's called Pale Blue from um, my La Plume one. This one is the Pastel Blue. Oh, sorry, here. So it's very pale, and this one's really light as well. One of them is actually called, you know, pale blue. Let me try something right here. Now this is super light. I'll just add some these streaks across like that. What I'm doing is that type of art. You get it. It's almost invisible. It's kind of a nice foundational color. I can add it into my rooftop here as well, and it not be too obtrusive, you know, it's all practically invisible. Boy, that one's a really good one for me in terms of what I'm doing with it. Um, that one's pretty apparent here. Let me do some of this kind of mark in here. And I'll go this one and I'll blend that out a little bit. So you can cross browns too. Okay. Let's see here. One of the things I thought about doing is I might add in this little kayaker down here. I'm not really sure. I might just leave it as is, but I don't know. Figure it out. And I thought about adding some foreground in here with this uh, overhanging branch, too. Which I may do. I'll do that in the, uh, the Versifying, I believe. But, alright. Um, one of the things that I went out looking at yesterday was we've had kind of regular rains out here in Southern California, so we've had a lot of wildflowers. Starting off, especially in the kind of lower deserts right now and uh, in the chaparral as well so um, let's see I thought I would do some of that and 
Let me look at some pens. I think uh, my son might have taken some pens to work on his Valentine's Day cards. Let me go see if I can find those. Okay, we have some white, pink, and purple. Purple would be really great for some uh, that lupin, lupine, lupin. And uh, you see that a lot um, in Sierras and uh, Chaparral, everything like that. Deserts, and it's a really fantastic color to, uh, to pair with that uh, type of green right here, but also you have this thing called Pearly Everlasting. I mean, there's all kinds of different tones, but um, as far as adding some additional textures in here, this is really something that I have a ton of fun with. Okay, I'm going to need to really zoom in here to see some of this. I'm using um, my <clears throat> shuttle art white here, which is not very opaque, okay? So it's very translucent. Uh, my uniballs, I've, I don't know, are practically out of ink, so I'm using this one, which will work too. I guess, I don't know. It's kind of more of a distant looking scene, so maybe this will be even better, but uh, any of these little textures like so into our grassy areas, kind of adding in some visual interest, like when I'm doing something in the sky, sometimes I'll add little stars or something like that into my sky. It's just simply adding a nice texture to a given area that I think is otherwise a little bit, you know, I'm tempted to use the word boring, but uh, it isn't boring until you add this in there and you think there is a lot more life kind of in here. Boy, it's pouring outside right now. Um, but you see that little twinkly thing in there? See this that area in here, there's nothing really happening, but you add that little texture in there. And it just, I don't know, it, it, there's something kind of sparkly about it. It's like little um, sparkles of light or something within the scene. It, it kind of makes it shimmer a little bit and brings the overall card, I think, to life, but especially small areas to life, okay? So look at this area out here. It's rather, rather kind of murky and dull, right? And you just kind of add a few little dots like this. I kind of cluster mine, kind of taper it off a little bit, like this. See that? Then you have all these little things in here to bring out that little visual interest. See that? kind of happening back in here. I can do some right in here, maybe. It won't stand out too much. You have to have it kind of a little bit toned in, you know, in order to see these dots. You can't put a white dot on a white, you know, background and have it show. But, um... I don't know. It just looks... kind of... I don't know, more complete, I guess, I can say, uh, to my eye. All right, now you have this area down in your water, and there's nothing more kind of beautiful than sitting around in like a body of water and having, looking across there and having the light kind of sparkling and it's shimmering out there, so you can kind of do the same thing in these types of areas, and what you're doing is you're bringing in Kind of this visual continuity between land and water. You have these two different bodies of, uh, you know, within your given scene. And what we're doing is we're creating this continuity between them in terms of a, um, a similar texture. So we have similar colors. We have blue in here and blue up there. I've added a little bit of tan in here to down here. So we're doing it with color. We're doing it with texture, too. We have these streaks of... Uh, color in here 
and leaving streaks of light where we didn't you know tone it out all the way and we have that down here now you're creating this additional texture in here that kind of brings everything together a little bit more and it's just darn fun too Do we have this little area here? I've never really uh, taken with this area here, but I wasn't worried about it either because I know that I can add in some additional texture down here, which would kind of bring that area to life and make it a little, a little bit more dimensional and not quite as muddy. So you have something kind of when you're doing when you're doing these little dots in here, you're bringing this kind of little, little sharp element, in, crisp, I guess not sharp, crisp element into it. And it just kind of brings it to life a little bit more. See that? See, so yeah, doesn't that look more dimensional now? You know, in terms of this three three dimensional kind of aspect of it. And it's just a couple little dots. All right, now, you, if you want to bring in some additional um, dimension to some objects, let's take a look at some of these rocks down here. I, in my designs, I bring try to bring as much detail into the finest, the smallest of elements. So you can see this rock is lighter on the top than the bottom, right? Well, if we shade the bottom of it, you know, with our alcohol markers and things like that, then why not go in and highlight the lighter side of it? So we darken the bottom side and lighten the lighter side. So see these rocks now here have a little bit of a highlight on the top of them. So you shade the bottom and highlight the top. Same thing with these rocks over here if you want to do something like that. See how fun that is? It's just, it kind of makes them stand out a little bit more, so. I don't know if someone's going to look at the scene and say, oh, look at that highlight on that rock, but when they look at the overall, it just seems a little bit more dimensional as a result of having this little fun little details in it. So let's take a look at some of these in the background here. Um, See that right over here? And uh, on some of my sh little shoreline areas, I have a little bit of a um, highlight. I can kind of highlight that and create a little bit of a separation between the shore if I want to and the water, like that, a little bit of a line work. Up on this cabin up here, I have these little textures running that way. I, I can, you know, a little bit of a texture and uh, highlighting on my rooftop or something. So, Here can have a little bit of a highlighting. Hmm. Okay. All right. Let's go with some color. Let's go with this lavender here. All right, this is a Sharpie paint pen. I bought it in a pack of uh, five uh, pastel colors. I 
Yeah, you can use gel pens too. Um, this one, I don't know, it has that kind of that that value that I like. Let me see if I have that. I must have it in a pen form with my 180 color set here. That looks pretty good, right? Let me try this one. I've probably never used this one before. All right. Remember what I said about purple and green going well together, right? I really like that combination, but you see that right there? I don't know if you you can't see like every little dot, but I think you can kind of see that um, that tinge of a uh, purple right up there. How about right around my? Maybe they walk in through that way, so I won't put flowers right there, like they're gonna step on it. But see that real tinge of a lupin to each side of my little pier there. Really love wildflowers. Okay, how about over here? It's this little area up here. So if these little dots are kind of like lighting, you know, when they're done in white, this is kind of just providing an, a little extra texture. And uh, we're kind of expanding our kind of color range too, you know, when you're doing something like this. I think the color scheme becomes a little bit more sophisticated with the introduction of a you know, kind of a complementary color within a given space. See, it's just kind of, you can see that little tinge of purple here and there, here and down around here. See, that's what it looks like kind of overall. All right, let's bring it in to this side as well. Kind of cluster it a little bit. Oh, over here, I forgot to do uh, some of my little highlights. Let's highlight some of those rocks down there and kind of bring this area to life a little bit more. Okay. Sometimes it's just a little dot on the top of a rock. Some little shimmering water around it too. So let's take a look and see this little spot here. So I think that little area is kind of nice now. You know, look at that. Is that kind of a fun little area now with that little color? pops of color and pops of light and highlights in here. Whereas before it was looking a little bit, it was, it was looking a little anemic and kind of undefined, I guess. It's, it's brought something, this area here now has something for, you know, a, a reason to look over here now, <laughs> you know, and plus it, it just balances things off. There's a lot of little details happening around here, so it's kind of nice to have something around here, too. Okay, all right, let's see in here. what it looks like right here without the glare of the camera uh, lights.
All right, let's take a look and see if this will give us a little bit more of, I don't know, some kind of element. It's a, that lavender paint pen. See, all flowers don't have to be exactly the same value, so I'll kind of group this in. I'll put a few little dots of this one in. It's like a lighter version of that purple, and I'll just kind of group it in with, you know, where I've already applied some of the gel pen um, lavender tone. Okay. Okay, that looks pretty good, I think, in terms of uh, those flowers right there. It's kind of nice, you know, like I said, you don't have to always go with, I mean, if you have, you know, different pens, why not use them? You know, you don't have to just be stuck with one version of something uh, of a given hue. You can play around with different media if you have it. Think of the what things you might have uh, in a similar tone, but maybe in a different medium. You know, paint pen, gel pen, whatever. Okay, now let's put on some finishing touches on this in terms of a, an additional texture. Let's play around with some pigment ink on a Q-tip. I have a lot of videos dedicated to just this and kind of going back to that concept of building things up nice and gradually this really applies. I'm fraying my Q-tip here. I want something to apply nice and softly so it stands to reason that you'll have a nice soft applicator. See how frayed that is and kind of unwound, I guess. I don't want it completely, you know, floppy, but... Um, Let's see if I got that correct. All right. Color box, uh, color box um, frost white, blot it off. Look at that, it's, it's way too much right there. So I'll blot this off and I'm kind of softening my tip here and pounding it down a little bit. Yeah, I might have frayed it too much, let me see. Okay, that's what I want. I want a nice soft application. Okay, starting off in my lighter areas, I'll just kind of start applying some down. And what this is doing is it's kind of diffusing my imagery a little bit with just some kind of lighter, frosty applications. A very thin layer of pigment ink being applied here. So that right there, it's kind of put it in a little bit of a little bank of fog or something like that. It's, I don't know what this is saying is that the the weather is nice and calm too and I don't have all this kind of fog just blowing away, right? So those of you going back to that <laughs> idea of weather, you know, this is a nice kind of warmer tinge, you know, when there's kind of fog out it kind of holds in the heat a little bit more. Or there's a little bit more of an kind of this insulated layer of a uh, of uh, moisture, keeping the heat in. Okay. Not that it can't be foggy out in really super cold weather, but this one's, you know, we have some warm tones around here, so I don't think that's the case in this scene. Cabin looks pretty cool as is, but let's put a little bank, you know, a little bit of fog, you know, coming off of that uh, grass right here in a small little area just to I don't know, doesn't it look kind of I don't know, it's it's 
it's soft. It's it's kind of it's very welcoming like that, you know. Um, to have something like that, and see, I'm oscillating. I'm not putting it all over this bank right here. There's a little bit over here. Here's a little bit over here. If you ever add any in that doesn't look, you know, right, or there's too much, just kind of tap it off a little bit, and it'll come right off. Let's look at some of these uh, trees in the background here. Let's put a little bit of a mist, you know, kind of a at the base of them. Any kind of movies where people are walking around out and you know kind of forested area, they really bring in the uh, the fog machines and have a ton of fog kind of rolling around in the background there. And that's gives it kind of atmosphere and there's a little bit of movement and just it's visually kind of more stimulating having that kind of that variation happening back there. Okay, like that. Let's take a look at it overall. How about some back here? How about some of the distance right in here? What I'm doing is I'm kind of removing some of my finger. It just comes right off of my finger, like so. Put some down here in this little meadow. Hey, how about some in the distance right in here? I think this distance little area could use a little bit of a tinge of a kind of different texture. See that little bit back there? It's kind of like a little floating cloud or something like that, which, you know, that moisture kind of is, right? And a lot of people love looking at clouds, you know. Could be on a conscious or subconscious level. They kind of are elements that kind of, uh, you know, we think of like daydreaming or something like that. Clouds are like this kind of an icon for things like that. So it's just kind of adding in that same type of uh, foundational element, you know, in terms of, you know, floating texture into a scene like this, hovering texture. Okay, how about around here? Now, this will dry um, darker than what it looks like right now, so I think I'll leave it about like that. Just a little additional touch to add in there, like so. Okay, now I have all that laid in. Let's go back in. I was thinking about some additional foreground element. It won't be too big of a addition because uh, I have a lot of things going on in this background right here, but. I wanted to try out this um, overhanging um, tree limb design right here that I haven't used yet. This is an unmounted stamp that I'm using with my tack and peel applies to my acrylic block. All right, now here's my VersaFine Black. I want something nice and dark and bold. Okay, now the VersaFine isn't one to use inherently if you're going to do all this coloring over it because it's a pigment ink. It's going to sit on top of this, so I'm using this as my final um, element 
You know, nothing nothing is going to go on top of it. Okay, you can see what that is, what those tree limbs look like. I have actually have some little bug bites and holes in my leaves, you know, for that extra little um, detailed touch on these ones. It's like, why did I do little bug bites before? <laughs> you don't think about it in terms of uh, designing sometimes, you know, those little fine little points, but I think it kind of adds to the overall feel of something when you have, you know, something that the details as minute as that, but look at that. So it kind of puts us as a viewer sitting up on some ridge line looking down into that area. Doesn't it look a little bit more three-dimensional again by adding in this one extra touch like that? Okay, let's go in this another one like this. And you can see the difference between the Versafine and the Marvy Black that I've used to stamp it out in. <laughs> that Versafine is quite thick. It maintains the detail and uh, it just works great as a, a foreground element. Okay, look at that. Isn't that fun? Having that kind of overhanging tree limb right there. Look at kind of the distance that kind of creates between um, us and the distant objects. And now we have something kind of close to us and something, I wouldn't say that's real far. It's not like far as if we were putting like a, you know, a cloud and a moon or something like that. But in terms of this composition, that is the, you know, the distant object in here. All right. So that looks pretty good in terms of that branch. It gets me thinking, I'm not quite sure, I might want to add in some additional element in here. Like a tree or something like that, done in like a darker tone. Let me think about that one. That looks awfully good in terms of that foreground in there. Um, I'm also starting to think about this little kayaker again too. Let's go ahead and do that. Interesting. I think these leaves in that little kayaker have just, I don't know, it's changed the kind of the feel of it, hasn't it? You know? I liked it before, but I like it this way too. All right. Here's some little um, rock textures. Let's do something with this one. I like my water like that, but um, let's go in and add. <laughs> I mean, this is so texture filled at this point in time. I don't think it's loud or busy or something like that, but this is my little tiny rock stamp. Um, just a little kind of a textural element, but. And this is just my Bahama blue. Okay. I'm going to add in a little bit of texture around in here. This will look a little bit lighter when it dries. The kind of pigment ink dries darker and dye-based inks dry lighter. 
you know. So I think this will add just a little bit of extra, very subtle texture into the scene, into that composition. All right. Nice spring. Springtime scene in the uh, your weekend house in the cabin, in the hills, in the mountains, in the warmth, relatively speaking. And you're all invited. That's when we have a uh, like a little stamping retreat, kind of in this type of setting. Although when we were at Stamping Treats, we just spend all the time indoors anyways. But, uh, <laughs> you know, we can always look outside or, you know, maybe that's where the uh, lunch will be served. Um, I'm just making this up. Someone will say, hey, where, where is that, you know? But um, anyway, it's a fun scene to do, and I'm glad I had a chance to uh, finally finish it off. Like I said, uh, when I do these types of... Uh, compositions like this I really get the itch to uh, kind of finish them off um, from the uh, stamp sketch versions of it and I really want to see what they look like um, kind of fully realized so this scene right here um, this composition would have been really fun to do too and I'll have to get around to it maybe on my other stamp sketches that I did with that um, doing it in a kind of winter tone I want this a little bit lower so I can have like this um, pigment ink kind of um, steam or smoke coming out of that little chimney right there, which would be really fun. But, um, I don't know, I'll play around with that um, later, but um, anyways. Hope you enjoyed the scene, hope you enjoyed the, uh, the how, how to, you know, the finishing of it, and uh, enjoying the process of it. You can really see what uh, it goes through in terms of its evolution, in terms of what one color might look like, but if you just kind of keep layering your tones and, and retaining your lighter areas, um, you know, these scenes are fairly easy to uh, finish off like that. Um, now this is a large scene, so this one, you know, this finishing portion of it took me a little while to do, but just because it's, you know, it's large in scale, all right? relatively speaking so um, play around with uh, I really encourage you to play around with um, a lot of media that you might have I actually used a little bit of colored pencil in here you know you can use your different brands of uh, alcohol inks you can um, I don't think I can use like chalks or pastels on glossy paper you know the, the colored pencil you know worked out okay because it's you know a hard medium and uh you know while it's waxy you know they you know it's really works best with a matte paper with a little bit of tooth to it you know you can use it here and there um to vary for various uh, effects to various degrees of effects but um i don't play around with it and really utilize um uh, all the different things you have uh for different textures and uh touches that are very conducive to what they, you know, bring to the table. Colored pencils are really great for little tight detailed areas, you know, if I did a few little scratchy marks I can go with something like, you know, this green and I can put, you know, a few little, you know, little grassy bits in here, you know, for something like that because that's what colored pencils are really perfect for, so really expand out. I wouldn't really call this you know, a multimedia piece and, you know, kind of the, you know, the true spirit of multimedia. This is, you know, barely visible on here, but it's perfect for like little tiny details, you know, going in here like so. And, uh, you know, I think it looks really good. And uh, all of it kind of ends up, you know, kind of lending itself to kind of a more varied and rich surface as a result. Okay, so, and I know you guys have all of that too, so, <laughs> we all do, don't we? You know, we have this, you know, all this media that we, uh, we've amassed and collect, because that's kind of the part of the fun of, uh, you know, what we do is, uh, 
getting new things, you know, cool new things, you know, with the idea that uh, all these concepts we have of what we'll do with it, but um, I don't know. You kind of have to have it out on your desk, you know, to uh, to utilize it, you know. So, I don't know, do a few of them and, you know, utilize that while you have it out. So, and just see what happens. So, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for tuning into the channel. If you have any questions, drop us a note or drop us a, a visit. Drop a stampscapes.com a visit and take a look at our information section and other videos available.